Hello Lab Rats and welcome to the Metal Lab Podcast. I'm Tom. And I'm Rich. God, this is the third one already, Rich. I know, it's... That's unbelievable, uh, isn't it? Coming around quickly. So I think we're going to um, just discuss this week is about music licensing and um, copyright. Um, for, and obviously give advice to any of the new bands out there that might be a little bit unsure on this topic. So are we going to kick off the show tonight with a uh, song, Rich? I think so, yeah. So before we get into obviously all the ins and outs and the legalities and the things that you should and should do in terms of copyright, yeah, let's get playing. Uh, so who's the first song, Tom? So we have a band from St. Neots in the UK. They're a five-piece hardcore band. They're called Own Your Life. And the track is called Us. Let's go. Great track from Own Your Life, and that was a track us. So, Rich, um, can you tell me a bit about obviously your background and how you got into music licensing? Yeah, sure. So, it started um, in around about 2008. I got a job with PRS for Music, so the Performing Rights Society based here in the UK, and they deal mainly with um, licensing out copyrighted music for venues. Um, and for public performances of any music, so whether that's on TV, radio, 
Um, we collect the royalties from these companies and then we distribute that back out to the people who actually write the music. So that's where it first started. I was there on the phone selling music licenses and renewing licenses to businesses. Um, from there I moved into the operational side of things and then eventually into helping to design and to implement the infringement and enforcement processes in the new uh, PRS PPL uh, company that came up out of that. Sounds really cool. So what made you get into the whole license and um, you know the copyright and stuff? In fact, what, what sort of gained your interest in it? Yeah I'd like to say it was the the interesting side of music licensing and copyright, but that's a lie. It, it was basically just, I needed a job, being a musician at the time, being in bands, obviously anything related to the music industry just seemed exciting in a, in a way in. It wasn't until I actually started doing the job that I realised that I'm one of those sad individuals that actually enjoys the legality, the legal side mm -hmm. of it and that understanding. And it is one of those subjects that is very dry, can be very, very boring, but if you're into it, it can be really interesting and there's lots of nuance um, involved with this and again from do do work in my work with PRS it's allowed me to actually give advice to people and to help others not make some mistakes and also to help give people an opportunity to actually make money from their music because at the end of the day part of what we're trying to do here at the Metal Lab is not only promote the underground scene but also make it a viable option for people to actually make a living from. It's If you've created something, if you put your your heart and soul into something, um, I'm not saying that the only reason you should do it is for monetary value but if somebody's making money from your art then you should also be making money from that art. Definitely. And, uh, Getting your songs copyrighted is definitely one of those things that can help get you some money for doing what it is that you love to do. Okay, so we're going to go on to um, our next song. After that, we will talk a little bit about the difference between PPL and PRS. Ooh, more of that fantastically yeah. dry, <laughs> interesting so, stuff. <laughs> so who have so, we got? So our next band are from Sweden. They're called Blackened Blood. Okay, um, they're a sort of heavy metal band that have the melodic sort of spin to them as well um, and the track is called Devil's Dice Nice
from Bofuquo. You're listening to the Metal Lab podcast. Keep it metal. So that was Doble's Dice by Black and Blood. Very nice track. So now, Rich, can you explain to me and all the listeners the difference between PPL and PPRS? And yeah. why is it important to have both? Okay, so in the UK and in most countries, um, there's not just one music licensing company. There, there are usually two. Some of them integrate, but the main differences are PRS um, is for the writers, composers, and publishers of music. So the people who actually write the music mm-hmm. and the lyrics. EPL for the recording artist, so the people actually record the song. So a good example would be someone like Girls Aloud, for example. They don't write the music and the lyrics for their songs, so PRS wouldn't pay them <clears throat> any money. Yeah. But when their songs got played on the radio, the people actually wrote that music and those lyrics got paid for it. It'd be PPL who would then pay Girls Aloud yeah. for the performance of the recording of it. So if you're a recording artist, mm-hmm. Um, and you also write your own music and your lyrics, you best to join both. It does mean that if you've written a song and you've performed that song on a record and it's that recording that gets played on the radio, you get royalties not only from PRS but also from PPL. If, however, you're just a performer and you're a session musician and you're playing a musical instrument on a recording, when that recording gets played, you're entitled to a percentage of that. Mm. So it's it's just the differences in the way that people involved in creating the music, how is it that they get paid from that music then being sold on. Oh, great. So the issue of copyright yes. is always a bit of a thorny subject for artists and bands. Yeah. So if you're a solo artist or maybe a producer even, what's the best way to protect your music? So again, this is an interesting one. So. Technically, as soon as you have created something, Mm -hmm. it is under UK copyright. So an idea in your head, you can't copyright, but as soon as you put that down pen to paper or you create a piece of art or a piece of music or there's a tangible thing, you hold the copyright of that. The difficulty comes if somebody else has also managed to create something that is exactly the same, it then comes, well, who created it first? Who who is the true author? So... There may be circumstances where two independent people never met, come up with exactly the same thing, and at the same time try it and register it. Mm-hmm. But obviously that would be very, very rare in those instances. Yeah. So the, the idea being that the once you've created this, you need some form of proof that you own it, you have created it. So back in the day when we were younger, um, it'd be, I remember recording onto a tape putting it in an envelope, going to to, to the post office, getting them to register a post to yourself. And so it was then date stamped. And so that used to be a mark. That used to be the old way of copywriting it. It's a lot easier these days, especially if you send something via email, it's got a date stamp on it. It's got, it's actually got a tangible Mm -hmm. reference to when that thing was created and sent. So if you can prove that you created it on this day first, it's there. The difficulty comes when somebody claims that you have copied their work because of the similarities and what it sounds like. And because there are only 12 notes in the scales, obviously there are going to be chart t- times where things do sound familiar. But it's up to then the person who owns the copyright to prove that that person was influenced or has taken something that belonged to them. There are going to be times when you're influenced by somebody and it goes, oh, well, that sounds like somebody else. And sounding like is not the same as copying. And so it can be quite fickle in terms of who owns what. But if you've got clear evidence that I created this, this is when I did it, Mm. and yours was afterwards, then that's when you can win. It it just becomes difficult when when you, you can't clearly see who came first and so... That's awesome. So that kicks into our next song because we're talking about similarities. Yeah, so nice. our next song is from the band. Uh, he's for actually a sort of solo artist. He's um, from a town near Peterborough called Market Deepin. He's yeah. called Andy McGurk. So well, I hope he's a PRS and PPL member. I then. hope so. Um, Andy has a sort of band project called Vulgar Rhythm, which is nice a very name. unique sound. Um, as you were saying about the similarities, we listened to this track the other day um, and we've come up with a sort of 
the similarities of Nine Inch Nails. Yes, so, yeah, it reminded me of that. And again, this is one of those instances where just because you can hear the similarities or you can hear the influences, it doesn't mean to say they've copied it and it's not something in and of themselves that yeah. Paul Griffin have created. But again, it comes down to, so this is not a breach of copyright. No, no, of course This not. is somebody who's taken something and made something else that's just as awesome. So this is Vulgar Rhythm with the track Why Did I Have To Make It Rain? Let's go. I'm in the comfort zone, I feel up with rage in my baby Even though I feel there's nothing wrong, there's something troubling my baby That was Vulgarism with Why Do I Have To Make It Rain? What a classic track that was. Yeah, very nice. Okay, so let's get back to the nitty gritty. Yeah, so, okay. how does how does the artist monetize um, at an early stage? 
Yeah, so obviously in this day and age most people want to know how they can make a living from their art. It's It can be very easy or it can be very hard mm. on that. So the, the reality is the more it gets played, the more you can get paid. So if you've created a piece of music or you've written some lyrics and you've created a song, join a music licensing company. It's not that you can't do this on your own. Like I say, as soon as you've created something, you effectively own the copyright of it. Mm -hmm. If somebody else is playing it and making money, you can take them to court for breach of copyright. Um, and so you can try and get your money back that way. I would recommend anybody who is creating and serious about trying to make money from their art to join someone like PRS PPL. Um, there are fees involved with this, and so this is where you've got a sort of offset. Do, am I, could I make enough money for my music in order to get my initial outlay costs back there? So, as most people, when we were younger, we used to record tapes and CDs, mm -hmm. hand them out and sell them. There's no, that's the easiest way to try and make money. Obviously, you don't make much money. You can uh, put your stuff onto iTunes, you can put it onto YouTube, mm -hmm. you can put it onto one of these places. Where these music licensing companies come in at this point is, they actually monitor all of these places. If, for instance, your song gets played on a radio station, um, we know, or they can find out whether those radio stations are being played in pubs or in clubs or in bars or here, there and everywhere. And so they collate that information um, and then they find out sort of how often it's being played and you mm -hmm. get a percentage, you start getting money back from them, depending on how many people are involved in writing the song. So if there's 10 people, that money will get split 10 ways or whatever the percentage is awesome. on there. But I'd say the easiest way to start making money from that is to join these societies, register that you've got your, your music up on iTunes, on wherever it is, on Deezer, on YouTube, on Facebook, wherever you're keeping all your music and they can help keep track of that and then give you the royalties. The other thing with this is as well, when you play live, because venues have to pay a music license in order to cover the copyright music being played, you register your band playing somewhere and then you'll get money. So I think for a venue that's capacity of around 100 people, mm -hmm. if it's just you playing there, you'll probably get around, I think it's between six and eight pounds a show, which doesn't seem like a lot of money, but that's for 100 people, so obviously if there's 1,000 people in there, up to 1,000 people, then that's £80 just for playing your music. And then if you're playing these so many shows a week, and so it's not that that's the only means of money you get. Obviously if you're playing a venue, you get paid by the venue to play, and then this is the money on top of that for your creative endeavours on there. So I'd say definitely join a licensing company. Obviously I'm a little biased to PRS for music. I no longer work for them, but they were a fantastic company to work for and I really truly believe in what it is that they're trying to achieve in making music accessible for everyone but making sure the musicians get a fair price for that music because there is definitely value in music. So yeah, join the society, start plugging your music, get it out there, put it on all of these music downloading sites and just start advertising basically. The more people listen, the more chance of you getting paid. Awesome. So is there a difference in public performance and private performance on licensing? So private, so you don't need necessarily a license for private performance. So I think the language is more difficult and play, causes more difficulties than the actual law in that essence. So a public performance is where you are taking it out of the domestic environment. So there are a few exceptions with this. So PRS, for example, although a wedding will be taking place in a public area, so in a public hall or somewhere like that, PRS chooses not to charge any royalties on that because that seems it's more like an extension of your of your own family and mm -hmm. friends. So if you bought a CD, you was at home, you was playing a party, yeah. you wouldn't need a music license for that because it's private coming in. Mm -hmm. If, however, you started charging people on the door to come in, then technically you would need a music license because you're then mm -hmm. making money and you're charging people to come in, so it then becomes public. Uh, the other extreme for this, and again, something that people don't pursue <laughs> from a legal point of view, but if you're playing stereo whilst you're having a picnic, you're technically publicly performing that music. Mm. And so, under the strictest sense of the law, you would need a license or permission of yeah, the person. Of but obviously, it's one of those things where, no, no one's, that, that's not the, the case with that. So it is, it's more of making sure that if, I suppose the other side of that is, 
if you're putting on a show and you're not charging, that doesn't make it a non-public performance mm -hmm. either. It's in the same way that if you're a pub and you're playing music, so we used to have this argument a lot with some publicans, why do they need a music license? Um, they're advertising the musicians, people come and ask them what songs, so really the musicians should be paying them for advertising the music. And it's like, no, it doesn't work that way. Mm. If I'm going, if there's two bars and one's playing metal music and one's playing mum music, I'm going to go in the one with metal music. I'm not going to go in the one with mum music. Yeah. It becomes a bonus. It becomes a selling point for mm -hmm. that venue. And if yeah. you've got a choice of going to a pub where there's no music or some music, I'll okay. go in the one with some music. Definitely. So again, so it's it's about when you when the music is adding value to something, and that thing is making money from that, whether whether it is physical money or whether it's advertising or things like this, then that's when the musicians and the people who've created that music deserve to get a piece of that pie and this is basically what it's all about is if somebody's making money for music then the people who create that music also should be getting paid for it and it's that's part of what we're trying to promote to make sure that people can get music out there but also know that there is a value to it and value always costs it's it's just the fact of the matter Definitely. So that leads us into our next band. Oh fantastic. So Who's this? They are from Aberdeen and they're called Dead Fire and the track is called In My Mind That Belongs to the Devil. Let's go.
this is Marcus from Sonic Detour, and you're listening to the Metal Lab Podcast. So cool, that was Deadfire with My Mind That Belongs to the Devil. Yeah, great track. So, what advice would you give to new up-and-coming artists that don't have PRS or PPL at the moment? So, if you're just starting, obviously there are some costs involved with joining these licensing companies. I'm not entirely sure what the cost is at the moment. Um, I think it may even be somewhere around £100 or something Mm -hmm. like that. So, like I said before, depending on how much your music is being put out there will depend on whether it's actually cost effective for you to do this. Like I said, because as soon as you've created something, you own the copyright of it. So as long as you can prove the time and the date that you created it, and it was just you that created it, or the number of people that created it, then if it goes to court of law, you can use that. But obviously, people want to start trying to make money from this as soon as possible, and I'd recommend trying to do that, even if it is you're doing it just for the art, if you can make some money from it, then it'd be much easier for you to then create more art later on. So you can contact PRS, PPL, mm-hmm. or depending on what country you're in, so there's BMI, there's ASCAP, there's yeah. SACRA, GSAS, CSAM. So there's every country has their own licensing company. So I would say go online, double check on there. If you're just starting out, get your stuff recorded, um, and then you can actually get in contact with these places you'll submit your music to them once your music is submitted they're given a code and it's that code that then is recognized for every track wherever it gets played in in the world basically so if it's on youtube it knows it's on youtube if it's on deezer it knows you deezer spotify so on itunes whatever on that i would say it's for me for any musician just starting out try and just build up a fan base first off yeah once you've got that fan base, once you're starting to get this, that's when I think you start worrying about getting your stuff copyrighted. Like I say, make sure everyone knows this is your stuff. Exactly. But if your music isn't getting played yet, if you're not playing shows, if it's not getting played online, if you're if you're just creating, I wouldn't worry too much mm. about that side of it. However, as soon as you start gigging, as soon as you start getting your music up on iTunes or on YouTube and you Spotify. start, yeah, Spotify, and you start getting plays, then get in contact with these licensing companies. So some of the, so somewhere like Spotify and YouTube, obviously you can, if you've got enough viewers, you've got enough members, subscribers, YouTube and such like, will start giving you some money. But that's based upon just the ad revenue that's being shown on your videos. That's not really directly yeah. related to your music. Whereas if you join someone like PRS, for example, if your music's being played on YouTube, not only would you get the money from YouTube, if you're part of that uh, community that mm-hmm. gets paid, you'd also get paid from PRS as well. So because the music is being used, plus the advertisers are on there. So I would say join as many of these societies, join the Musicians Union, um, have a look at what they can do for you, um, speak to them. But I'd say, yeah, join as soon as you can, um, keep a record of everywhere where you're playing, everywhere where you believe your music's being played, get in contact with, with, with these licensing companies and then they'll be able to work on your behalf to get the money for you. So just the last point I want to touch yeah. on, so you, you went over about um, earlier about you own, people owning the copyright of the songs and everything, Yeah. so if you're in a band mm-hmm. and the copyright is solely owned by your singer, yeah. he leaves, Yeah. Where do the band stand for future performances of them songs? So basically, I'm going sort of back to the 90s when, um, sort of late 90s, when Max Cavalera left Sepultura. Yeah. Um, they had a massive problem of singing a lot of the Sepultura songs because he wrote them. Yeah, so. And I'd imagine that a lot of bands could face this. Yeah, so, yeah, some really good points, mate. It's. One of the issues that has been in the past with bands is where one member has all the copyright for it. So, like I said, whoever registers the copyright is the person who is entitled to the money made from that music. So, in that example of Sepultura, every time... So, even when they were together, Max Cavalier would have been the only person making royalties, mm-hmm. which has been the downfall of a lot of bands where one member writes the music and the lyrics or is down as the main writer and gets all the money whereas I've never been in a band 
where the music has been 100% totally written by one person. Mm -hmm. You'll get in a rehearsal studio when people come up with other little bits or they add things into yeah. it and change it. So I always feel it's a little unfair there's only ever one person who gets all of that, that money. In terms of performing, so when he left, he still got all the money and none of the band did because they never did in the first place on there. So I imagine that wouldn't be great. No. In terms of playing live, you can play, the reasons that venues have music licenses is to cover them for all music being played. So what would, have, what would happen at that point is the Sepultura of Outmask Cavalera would play, they'd submit their set list of what they played to their relative music licensing company, yeah. and if it wouldn't be ASCAP or someone yeah. with BMI with them. That company then looks at all those songs being played and finds out who owns the copyright for each of those songs. So if they played Chaos AD, for example, they wouldn't get any money from, from the uh, collecting society mm -hmm. for that. But the band would get paid by the venue for performing as musicians. Wow. So they get paid as, as musicians, as an entertainer, but the extra money that would come from the copyright, they wouldn't get. So every time they played, if it was one of Matt's Cavalera's songs, Matt would get a cut of it. Well, it, it is, but at the same time, it's if you've spent, if you poured your heart out into a song and it's your song, and then obviously if somebody else was making money from it, it's like, well, that's that's mine. And so this was one of the things with Prince for for those of you old enough to remember. Mm -hmm. yeah. But with Prince, when he changed his name to Symbol, that was all over the copyright. So he had signed a deal with Sony under Prince to produce this amount of music. Yeah. So he couldn't release music as Prince without being in breach of his contract with Sony. So that's when he changed his name and released music under Symbol because it wasn't Prince releasing music, yeah. it was Symbol. And so this was also why you'll find when people are coming to the end of their con recording deals, they'll do a best of because most people sign a five album deal They'll start do four and buy that fourth one. They want a better deal because obviously when they first started, mm -hmm. the record company had a bit more sway. Or we can make them, and then by the time they get big, it's like, well, actually, we we've got more to say now. Yeah. And so that's why the last album is usually a best of because no one has to do any work. Just get it out there with that. I think one of the things that I've seen that worries me a little bit is where people are on YouTube more so because you have the options to create videos. So copyright doesn't just work in terms of audio, it also covers visuals as well, all mm -hmm. aspects of art. If you think about the simplest way to think of, if you didn't make it, you're not entitled to use it. Just simple as, and I've seen people create videos using other people's imageries, and whether it's even if it's something from an advert or a clip out of a film, you cannot do that without the permission from the person who created it. As much as you think, oh it's fine, it's only an advert, oh it's this or it's that, or oh it's a charity thing, oh oh, they wouldn't mind me doing this. Yes, yes they would, mm. because you're, you're, you're using something that that artist has created without their permission. Yeah. It'd be like me coming along, taking stuff of yours and then making money from it and just ignoring you completely mm. and just saying, oh no, no, but you'll be fine doing that. I know I've made a million pounds, but I'm not going to give you any money from that because, oh no, you don't mind, do you? Oh no, it's fine. And yeah. it, it's not fine. If you're ever if you're ever not unsure whether you can use something because of copyright, the answer is no. Basically, yeah. if you didn't make it, if you didn't record it, unless you've explicitly been given permission, or it very absolutely cl clearly states this is copyright royalty free, mm -hmm. then you cannot use it. And even then, just because when you get you start using something maybe royalty free, if the owner then decides to put a copyright claim on it, they're absolutely entitled to do so. So even if I created something and put it out there for free for now, I could change my mind. So one of the things that happened, there was a, a company that did a lot of hold music and things like lift music. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of their artists that were on their compilation CDs that they'd already sold, then signed recording deals with record companies. Oh, cool. But it also it meant those, those, those CDs that they sold previously as copyright free were no longer royalty free because there were some tracks on it that subsequently come fall under copyright right. so yeah so th it's it is it is a bit of a minefield but i'd say basically if you need if you need a bit of music that you can't write pay somebody to do it 
but also pay for the copyright of it. Now that person will always be have the right to be known as the creator, but they won't have the right to any monetary value on there. So it's, it's one of those things where there's some legalities in it, but basically if you didn't make it, don't use it. If you did make it, copyright it. I think that's as, as simply as I can put it. Brilliant. So that takes us into our last song of the podcast. So this is Nodes, who are a five-piece metalcore band from Kent, and the track is called Flame Alive. Awesome. <laughs> So that was Modes and Flame Alive. Awesome track. Yeah, so hopefully that's helped lighten things a little bit um, on copyright on there. Obviously, if anybody has got any other questions, by all means, uh, drop a comment or send us a message on our, maybe even on our brand new YouTube channel. Yes. Um, where you can come along and get to hear the, not only these podcasts but get to see some of the interviews and we're hoping it to build into a comprehensive place where people can come to find unsigned underground metal come to find their new favourite band who will then hopefully go on to make lots of money from PRS and PPL exactly 
So, Tom, um, anything else that's been, uh, any other announcements or anything that you need to put in for this month? Anything else that you're looking forward to? Any gigs or anything else that's coming up? I'm just looking forward to getting the YouTube up and running. We've got loads of really cool content, haven't we? We have and indeed. I, so, it's just, it's been a long process. The group's been going on Facebook for just over 18 months and we have took things step by step. We've not rushed anything out and I hope everyone who is a member and you know who has been on the journey with us accepts all the, the time that we have taken yeah and i think as the world starts opening up as more gigs start happening obviously keep an eye out for more live interviews and actually uh, the metal lab come into a local gig near you maybe um, yeah Def keep an eye for that kind of thing definitely we've got a couple of little things in the sideline that's quite cool and then we have obviously the derby alt festival in october yeah i'm really looking forward to that yeah i cannot wait to actually get out and actually go to a proper little festival get to meet all you lab rats out there definitely and um, yeah actually let our hair down well not that you've got hair but you can no. uh, you can let my beard put, put your beard down <laughs> yeah so guys, uh, thanks very much for listening and like I say, if you've got any other questions about copyright or music licensing, please, please, please get in contact. I'm more than happy to answer any questions, big or small, whether you think it's stupid or not, just get in contact. The more we can help people, the more we can get the information out there, the more we can promote, um, the more we can get metal out there and the more we can get people to understand how fantastic this genre is and how fan amazingly fantastic the whole community is that surround us. Definitely. So for all your news, reviews and your podcasts, come and join us at the new YouTube channel, The Metal Lab. The home of underground metal. Right, 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 right.